Hello and welcome to This Week in Tech Horror for the week of Sunday, September 19th to Saturday, September 25th, 2021. Well, it's been a very busy week for big tech, so let's start with the Iranian scientist that was assassinated by an AI-assisted remote control killing machine. I'm totally going to butcher this name, so so please forgive me. Uh, Mohsin Fakhrizadeh, 59, a physicist and officer in the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and a professor at the Imam Hussein University in Tehran, was killed on November 27th, 2020, while traveling with his wife from their vacation home. So yeah, this happened almost a year ago, uh, but we're just finding out the details now. The Mossad's computerized weapon was affixed to an abandoned-looking car stationed by Iranian agents working with an Israeli agency. The truck was laden with a camera and explosives so it could be destroyed after the hit. The hit team had to overcome several obstacles, including a slight time delay, as well as the recoil of the weapon that could change the bullet's trajectory. The report said that AI was programmed to compensate for the delay, the shake, and the car's speed without going into further detail. A total of 15 bullets were fired and the whole assassination was over in less than 60 seconds. No one else was hit or injured. This is how we end up creating Skynet, people. Rule number one in the Common Sense Handbook says, and I quote, don't give machine guns a brain. Moving on. Big tech companies snap up smaller rivals at record pace. The world's largest technology companies have snapped up smaller rivals at a record pace this year in a buying spree. Data from Refinitiv, analyzed by the Financial Times, show that tech companies have spent at least $264 billion buying up potential rivals worth less than $1 billion since the start of 2021, which is double the previous record that was registered over 20 years ago in 2000 during the dot-com boom. The commission last week released the results of a study on tech mergers and acquisitions activity from 2010 to 2019, putting a spotlight on a decade of frenetic activity in which companies bought up smaller rivals at a record pace. Barry Lynn, director of the Washington-based Open Markets Institute, is quoted, This deal-making is bad because it makes these corporations that much more powerful. It increases their power over the people who work for them, over capital markets and investors, and it blocks off the kind of competition that can bring innovation. NFTC chair Linda Kahn said the study highlighted how big tech companies systemically used acquisitions of startups to eliminate future competitors. Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft all declined to comment, gee, I wonder why. You see, they can't let what they did to their competition be done to them. Google crushed Yahoo and other search engines like Lycos and AltaVista in the 90s. Facebook crushed MySpace and Amazon crushed basically brick and mortar retail chains. And they dominate both online retail and cloud hosting today. So it'd be a real bummer if some young startup were to come along and give them a run for their money. So they take a page from the Borg's playbook and assimilate. Now, speaking of Google, a lawsuit alleges that Google CEO sought to keep incognito mode issues out of spotlight. Google chief executive Sundar Pichai in 2019 was warned that describing the company's incognito browsing mode as, quote, private was problematic. Yet it stayed the course because he did not want the feature under the spotlight, according to a new court filing. Users last June alleged in a lawsuit that Google unlawfully tracked their internet use when they were browsing incognito in its Chrome browser. Google has said it makes clear that incognito only stops data from being saved to a user's device and is fighting the lawsuit. Last month, plaintiffs deposed Google Vice President Brian Rakowski, described in the filing as the father of incognito mode. He testified that though Google states incognito enables browsing privately, what users expect may not match up with the reality according to the plaintiff's write-up. Okay, so let's open up an incognito window in Chrome and see what it says. Now you can browse privately and other people who use this device won't see your activity. However, okay, there's a however, let's, let's be fair to Google here. However, downloads, bookmarks, and reading list items will be saved. Chrome won't save the following information. Your browsing history, cookies and site data, information entered in forms. Your activity might still be visible to websites you visit, your employer or school, or your internet service provider. So yeah, nowhere do they mention Google itself might be collecting data, which is what the lawsuit alleges. But at least if we use Brave and DuckDuckGo, we'll be safe, right? 
Well, not if we rely on the food supply chain and healthcare infrastructure. After Biden warning, hackers define critical as they see fit. After a furious run of ransomware attacks in the first half of the year, President Joe Biden in July warned his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin, that Russia-based hacking groups should steer clear of 16 critical sectors of the U.S. economy. All right, let me see if I can predict where this article is going. I could be wrong. I'm just guessing. But I figure that maybe criminal organizations decided that they didn't give a flying crap what Biden said and attacked whatever the hell they felt like. Let's find out, shall we? In recent days, a Russia-linked ransomware group called Black Matter attacked a grain cooperative in Iowa, an incident that appears to test Biden's terms since food and agriculture is one of the protected sectors. Well, color me shocked. I, for one, could not have seen this coming. I was sure that if Biden asked criminal organizations nicely that they would have said, yeah, you know what, Joe, fair enough. We won't act like criminals. You can count on us, pinky promise. Cybersecurity experts have previously warned that claims in which ransomware groups appear to take the high ground should be taken with a grain of salt. What is this? Common sense in a news article? What the... The attack occurred on or around Friday, and Black Matter is demanding a $5.9 million ransom. New Cooperative has communicated with its feed customers and is working to create workarounds to get feed to animals while its systems are down. Farmers told Bloomberg News that grain delivery, normally a digital process, has gone old school. Workers are using paper tickets to take down truck weight and grain moisture content by hand, slowing down the process considerably. More common sense. See, technology can absolutely make things cheaper and easier, more efficient, and it's really smart of us to find ways to make that happen. But you know what's not smart? Hooking up critical systems to the freaking internet. Critical systems that, you know, could allow a hacker to take your entire business down from the other side of the world. You know what I really want to see? I want to see a news article along the lines of hospital or school or bank or whatever uh, says to the hackers, congratulations, you hacked the chat group that we use to organize our company's lunches. I guess we'll have to eat ham sandwiches today instead of pizza. Sorry, staff. That's the type of article I want to see. But you know what? Instead, we get news like this. Alaska discloses sophisticated nation state cyber attack on health service. A nation state cyber espionage group has gained access to the IT network of the Alaska Department of Health and Social Service or DHSS. The attack, which is still being investigated, was discovered on May 2nd earlier this year by a security firm which notified the agency. Oh, wonderful. So the agency itself didn't even know they were hacked. Someone else was watching and happened to tip them off. These are government systems. Don't forget that. Citing an investigation conducted together with security firm Mandiant, DHSS officials said the attackers gained access to the department's internal network through a vulnerability in one of its websites and spread from there. Oh, Jesus H. Christ. So let me get this straight. The hackers didn't even have to do anything clever or outside the box. Like, it's not like they they crafted these really clever phishing emails and sent them from email addresses that looked like they were coming from within the company so that, you know, employees would click it thinking, oh, this is my boss's email. I better open this attachment. It's safe. No, no, no. They did nothing like that. They just went to their freaking web page. They went to their website, they found a vulnerability, and they hacked it through that. And you know what I love? I love how they call this sophisticated. Like they probably had some idiot cheap ass contractors building out this website and and these features to do stuff online that really shouldn't be done online. And when those cheap contractors do a lousy job that allows hackers from across the world to, to gain access into the system, they... Call it, oh, it's sophisticated. Yeah, that's that's not sophisticated. Taking advantage of other people's stupidity and incompetence is not sophisticated. Data stored on the DHSS network and which could have been collected by the nation state group includes the likes of full names, dates of birth, social security numbers, addresses, telephone numbers, driver's license numbers, internal identifying numbers like case reports, protective service reports, Medicaid, etc., health information, financial information, historical information concerning individuals interaction with DHSS. Yep. So stuff like really personal uh, sensitive data that can be used for like identity theft and stuff like that. That's wonderful things, government. 
All systems breached by the intruders remain offline. This includes systems used to perform background checks and systems used to request birth, death, and marriage certificates, all of which are now being processed and reviewed manually, in person, or via the phone, like they probably should be. Again, why does everything need to connect to the internet? Like, don't get me wrong. I get that no one likes having to go to government offices and stand in line to get these licenses and and have this data processed. It's one of the things I hate the most in life, but these are really high risk items. And these are activities that you don't have to do every single day. And so if government is going to move these systems online, the least that we can expect from them is to get their freaking security right. But at least private companies get security right, don't they? Researcher dumps three iOS zero days after Apple failed to fix issues for months. A security researcher has published on Thursday details about three iOS zero day vulnerabilities, claiming that Apple has failed to patch the issues, which they first reported to the company earlier this year. Going by the pseudonym of Illusion of Chaos, the researcher has published their findings on Russian blogging platform Haber and has released proof of concept code for each vulnerability on GitHub. Uh, let's see what the vulnerabilities actually are. A vulnerability in the game D daemon that can grant access to user data such as Apple ID emails, names, auth token, and grant file system access. So that's great. Uh, the auth token means that hackers could potentially be able to hijack sessions, which would give them control over your account. Uh, and file system access means they can access any file stored on your device, meaning they might be able to mine them for, for information that might be useful to them, like credit card numbers, uh, passwords, nude pics stuff like that. A vulnerability in the any helper daemon that can be used from within an app to learn what other apps are installed on a device. Uh, so that could be useful potentially. I mean, if you've got an app installed to do your online banking, uh, that vulnerability would let the hackers know what bank you're using. An additional vulnerability in the any helper daemon can also be used from within an app to gain access to a device's Wi-Fi information. So that's great. I mean, they don't really go into detail about what, uh, what they mean by Wi-Fi information. Um, but if that vulnerability would let the attacker gain access to, to, to like information about, about the Wi-Fi network, then they could find out like what other devices are, are on the network, et cetera, which could help them like spread their attack to other systems within the network. The researcher said the vulnerabilities are still exploitable in iOS 15 release earlier this week. Oh, thanks Apple. So they released an entire new version of their operating system, knowing that these bugs are present in this version and they didn't fix them because screw the safety and security of their customers. If you use Apple, I am really, really sorry. An Apple spokesperson did not return a request for comment, gee, I wonder why, but several security researchers told the record that Apple might not have prioritized the issues as they could not lead to, quote, code execution. Yeah, that's not the point. It's true, a vulnerability that would allow a hacker to run their own code is very, very dangerous because then they can install malware and they can do a lot more damage. But that doesn't for a second downplay the seriousness of these vulnerabilities and their value to hackers. And remember, Apple knew about these for six months and did absolutely nothing, even releasing a brand new version of iOS with the bugs in them. Like, like they released iOS knowing these bugs were in them. Screw Apple. And it's crap like this that's led to 2021 breaking the record for zero day hacking attacks. A zero day exploit, a way to launch a cyber attack via a previously unknown vulnerability is just about the most valuable thing a hacker can possess. These exploits can carry price tags north of $1 million on the open market. Yep, because a zero day is a type of an attack that only the hacker knows about. It's kind of like someone having a master key to your house without you knowing, uh, so they can just come and go as they please. It gives them the element of surprise and you have no idea how they're getting in. So zero days leave the victims completely defenseless, not even knowing that they're vulnerable. And this year, cybersecurity defenders have caught the highest number ever, according to multiple databases, researchers, and cybersecurity companies. At least 66 zero days have been found in use this year, almost double the total for 2020 and more than any other year on record. 
So that means 66 brand new ways to hack various systems that have never been recorded were discovered by the good guys this year, making us wonder how many zero days are actually out there that we don't know about yet. So this leaves us desperate for some good news. And luckily, I have some for you. And, and it's not me, it's Facebook. Facebook has stepped up to the plate and they've done something good. They've prepared an apology for us. Facebook's latest apology reveals security and safety disarray. Oh dear. Facebook had it rough last week. Leaked documents, many leaked documents, form the backbone of a string of reports published in the Wall Street Journal. Together, these stories paint the picture of a company barely in control of its own creation. The revelations run the gamut. Facebook had created special rules for VIPs that largely exempted 5.8 million users from moderation. It forced troll farm content on 40% of America. It created toxic conditions for teenage girls, and it even ignored cartels and human traffickers. Nice. But now Facebook wants you to know it's sorry and that it's trying to do better. Facebook knows that talk is cheap, and so they want to show you that they really, really mean it this time. And to prove to you that Facebook's change, they've rolled out some much needed changes to their newsfeed algorithm. Facebook rolls out newsfeed change that blocks watchdogs from gathering data. Well, so much for transparency. The markup has found evidence that Facebook is adding changes to its website code that foils automated data collection of its newsfeed posts, a technique that groups like NYU's Ad Observatory, The Markup, and other researchers and journalists use to audit what's happening on the platform at a large scale. The updates add superfluous text to newsfeed posts in the form of ARIA tags, an element of HTML code that is not rendered visually by a standard web browser, but is used by a screen reader software to map the structure and read aloud the, con the, uh, the contents of a page. Wow. Let me translate that for you. So what they're doing is they are abusing a special feature of HTML that's actually designed to help the visually impaired. It's basically like metadata that uh, programmers put into their websites uh, that give like instructions and directions to screen reader software, a software that the visually impaired use to help them navigate websites. So Facebook's logic here is that the watchdog groups that they don't want scraping their newsfeed posts also use software that depend on that metadata. So screw the visually impaired. Nice. And speaking of tech going down the shitter, the smart toilet era is here. Are you ready to share your anal print with big tech? <laughs> Lou design has barely changed in 150 years. Um, that's because the design is perfect. It does exactly what you need it to. No more, no less. You sit down or stand over it, do your business, hit the little button, and then go about your day not thinking twice about it. Will people trade their privacy for the chance to find out exactly what is in their waste? Uh, God, I hope not. Uh, let's read a bit of the article. For the past 10 years, Sonia Grego has been thinking about toilets, and more specifically, what we deposit into them. Gross. We are laser focused on the analysis of stool, says the Duke University research professor, with all the unself consciousness, yeah, that's not a word, of someone used to talking about bodily functions. We think there is an incredible untapped opportunity for health data, and this information is not tapped because of the universal aversion to having anything to do with your stool. Okay, look, we already have brave men and women, heroes, if you will, who step up to the plate in times of need to analyze our shit when we need them to. The idea of having yet another everyday object in my home collect data about me and connect to the internet in order to share that data, like to, to remote servers and stuff is not something that I am okay with. So piss off, pun intended. Smart toilet innovators, uh, are you, are you kidding me? This is another thing that pisses me off in tech. Stupid, pointless buzzwords for absolutely everything. Can we just call them what they are, please? Shit fetishists. Shit fetishists believe that the loo could become the ultimate health monitoring tool. More like the ultimate privacy invasion tool. Grego believes her product, which analyzes and tracks stool samples and sends the data to an app. Okay, screw your app. We have more than enough apps already. Thank you. The world needs fewer apps, not more. 
will provide information related to cancer and many chronic diseases. For general customers, it will provide peace of mind. No, it won't. Uh, no, it won't. See, this reminds me of Theranos. Theranos was this startup that, that was founded a few years ago that promised investors that they were going to build a device that could detect multiple diseases, like a broad range of diseases based only on a single drop of blood. Uh, now, the former CEO is actually on trial right now for wire fraud because it turns out who would have thought that what they were promising to build was actually impossible. So what the Theranos machines actually ended up doing was they provided a ton of false positives and negatives. So back to these so-called smart toilets, imagine you wake up one morning, you drink your coffee, you do your business, and then your toilet's telling you that you might have cancer. Yeah, no thanks. But what do you think? Are smart toilets the future or are they the end of human civilization as we know it? Drop a comment down below to let me know. Also, please hit like uh, on this video and share it with your friends and then also subscribe. I really want to get this channel started and there's going to be another This Week in Tech Horror exactly one week from now. Thank you so much for watching and until next time.